Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Steve Thomas, better known as Gold Mining Bull. He's a US-based gold and silver mining investor and writer for Seeking Alpha. He also has 10 years experience trading the miners. How are you today, Steve? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you. We were speaking here on the 29th of October, the day after we saw gold go down about 1.2%. We saw the major indices go down between 35 to 4.5%. And we also saw miners go down 5 to 6% yesterday. So give us your thoughts on a move like that yesterday and how your experience in this sector really informs your decisions when looking at a day like yesterday. Yeah, sure. So in my opinion, it's a great day to be a gold bull. I mean, everything is on sale, essentially, right? So gold fell by, was it 1% the other day? And mining stocks, gold mining stocks, which are leveraged to the price of gold, fell by about 5% from what I saw across the board. Since then, gold is up a little bit, but the gold stocks have just gotten hammered. So I've been buying gold miners. I bought shares of two miners this morning. I've got cash on hand in case we test the 200-day moving average, which is 1770 an ounce. I mean, it's possible we go a little bit lower before the election, before the next stimulus comes in. But regardless, I just feel like it's a no-brainer here to be buying gold mining stocks, quality gold miners. They are massively profitable at these prices. They're profitable at 1900 They're profitable at 1800 1700 The margins are excellent. So... You know, gold could fall another $200 an ounce from here. And for me, it would be the same story. I would be buying, buying, buying. So I just put out coverage on Seeking Alpha on Agnico Eagle's earnings report that just came out today. They reported an excellent earnings report, and they raised their dividend by like 70%. Their stock now yielding 1.8%. So they reported probably the best quarter in their history and it's just not surprising to me because gold for Q3, the average price was over $1,900 an ounce. And the typical senior gold miner produces gold for less than $1,000 an ounce. So the margins are excellent. Gold is going to do just fine. I hope it does go down a little bit so I can buy more shares. And personally, I'm just really thankful for the recent dip. I'm ready just in case gold falls a little bit more from here. And I'll be buying more. You know, I was buying back in March when we saw that nasty correction. Well, we saw everything kind of sell off. But I was buying mining stocks when gold uh, sold off. And then, as we know, it bounced right back up. If we see another sell off, I think it would just be another V shaped recovery. And so, yeah, it's a great day. It's a great day to be a gold bull. Absolutely, Stephen. You basically write a service and show your entire portfolio on Seeking Alpha. So tell us a bit more about that, the services you provide there. Yeah, so I think one thing that sets me apart, or I hope it sets me apart from other analysts or newsletter writers or bloggers, is that I do put my money where my mouth is, and I'm very transparent. I put all of my trades, my entire portfolio, online at Seeking Alpha for my subscribers. So it goes back a couple of years, but I have my entire holdings, the price that I've paid for each holding, the price of every trade I've made, the value in dollar terms, and the percent of my portfolio. And so this is, you know, I'm putting it all out there. So it's almost 100% accurate, my real life holdings. I'm just trying to be as transparent as possible. And, you know, I think people appreciate that. Absolutely, Stephen. I think it's a great resource because you have some FAQs and some other resources on the side there. But I'd like to get your thoughts on your experience level in this sector is 10 plus years. So tell me about some of the lessons that you learned from the last crash, let's say 2011, 2012 in there. So during the last crash, that's the bull run was from 2009 to 2011. Of course, we saw gold shoot up really, really fast to 1900 an ounce. So before that bull run, I put all of my money into gold stocks, I became hooked on the sector. So, I mean, literally I would work like 60 hours a week and live on like 30% of my income and just invest all of that remaining money into gold stocks. So at the time it wasn't a ton of money, you know, I'm only 33 now. So back then I was like 23, but I put maybe 10, $15,000 into gold stocks. And I, I, like many listeners, I bought a lot of smaller juniors that went up four or five 
600% in price. But the reason I'm saying this is, of course, what happened next, I thought I was really smart. <laughs> I, I, you know, I made a lot of money. I thought I was really smart. And then I lost a bunch of money in the downturns. Mm -hmm. So I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of ill-advised moves. For example, trading on margin was a huge mistake. Speculating with options, putting too much money into warrants, thinking gold would just go up in a straight line. I probably listened to the wrong analysts back then. You know, I think you know what I mean by that. People who are just 100% bullish on gold prices all the time and say it will go up. I think I listened to them too much, but it was a difficult time, but it was exactly what I needed. It was a huge learning experience. So after that crash, I kind of hit the reset button on things. From 2013 to 2015, I got out of the very speculative, smaller companies at the time. I focused more on quality companies, producers, royalty companies. I started reading more technical reports. I spoke more with industry insiders and just tried to learn as much as possible about the sector so I could get better, right? And then I also started to dollar cost average my positions more. And I stopped trying to time the market because it's impossible. So most importantly, I didn't give up on the sector. I think, you know, there are definitely people who threw in the towel back then. But for me, the story hasn't changed for gold and for gold miners. They're the most attractive they've ever been as we speak here. And so I'm more excited about the sector today than I was back in 2010. I'm actually, I'm way more optimistic. So these sell-offs like yesterday, they're really nothing to me. You know, I've been through much worse. I know you have too. <laughs> and I just think that the story hasn't changed. The story for gold, gold is going way higher. The story for gold miners, they're undervalued. They're underappreciated. And their day is going to come. I mean, they're going to be bought by major investors. More and more people are going to realize that these are legitimate investments. You know, Berkshire Hathaway buying Barrett Gold might have been the start of that. But just watch, you know, these next couple of quarterly earnings are going to be fantastic. And I think we're going to start to see miners do really well. So that's my story. And that's why I'm gold mining bull. Awesome, Steve. You have a very interesting story. And to be able to share those lessons with our listeners and your readers as well is very valuable. So let's talk about ways that you break up your portfolio from producers to developers and explorers. What are some of the percentages and things that you're looking for there? Yeah, definitely. So I personally aim for about 50% of my portfolio in producers. So this includes senior gold miners, the larger ones that are producing over a million ounces a year, five plus billion market cap. I also have mid tiers, smaller ones that are growing fast. This also includes royalty companies. So that 50% will include large miners, mid tier miners, and royalty companies. Producers are a must own because you get leverage to gold. So if gold goes up 10%, the producers should go up two to three times that. Now it works both ways, of course. If it goes down 10% for gold, the miners could go down 30%. But you want that leverage to gold. If you think gold is going up in price, you must own producing stocks. Companies that are actually either mining the gold or getting revenue via a royalty or a gold stream. So they give you earnings, cash flow, and then dividends, and some actually have just started to buy back stock. So these are going to be fantastic performers. That's why I put about 50% of my portfolio. So just to talk quickly about what I focus on, lower cost producers that are producing gold for less than $1,000 an ounce on sustaining costs, producers that have growth potential, that have low cost growth potential. I try to avoid single asset mining stocks. So companies that only have one gold mine is kind of risky in my opinion. You know, what happens if something goes wrong with that gold mine? The stock will underperform. You know, that's all of their cash flow essentially. So it's a lot less risky if you have a gold miner that has five mines and one goes bust. Mm -hmm. You know, you're okay. So example, recent example might be Tentanin in Egypt. You know, they had a wall pit failure or something went wrong at their open pit mine. It's a great mine, but in the short term, the stock has been underperforming greatly because of that issue. It's the only asset they have. So I try to focus on more diverse miners, lower cost miners, strong balance sheets are important to me, or at least the miner that's working on improving their balance sheet. Try to avoid miners that have a lot of debt. It's just not good practice. And mining friendly jurisdictions are important. Exploration upside, reserves, 
at least 10 years of reserves is important. So that is essentially how I break up the producers. So developers make up 25% of my holdings, approximately. Developers are advancing a gold deposit in a favorable mining jurisdiction. They most likely already have a resource estimate. They might even have a technical report like a preliminary economic assessment release. So they've demonstrated some value to the market, but they still have much more value to create through advancing the project and achieving project milestones, such as permitting, proving up resources to reserves. But these, I like developers personally because I think they're the best takeover targets in the sector. I can give you two past examples of how I've made money with developers. Two companies in West Africa, Admiral Gold and True Gold Mining, they were both acquired at a premium by a mid-tier miner. So if you buy the right developer that's a takeover target, you can make money through M&A, which is nice. And another example might even be Barkerville Gold Mine. They are bought out by a Cisco. You know, similar story. They're a developer. They had a deposit. They had a PEA study release. So they already demonstrated that value and they got bought out. But I look for, if the company has released a technical report, I look for a high net present value for that project, even using a conservative gold price. So 1350, 1500 an ounce. I want to see a strong net present value, but I also look for low upfront capex, right? And low operating costs. So if you're going to take one thing away from this discussion with developers, bigger isn't always better. Sometimes bigger can be worse when we're talking about the size of a project. The reason is, you know, if you have a company that requires billions of dollars in upfront capital to build a gold mine, it's less likely to get built, in my opinion, than a company that maybe has a two or three million ounce resource, but has low upfront capital requirements, say 100 to 300 million, right? That's kind of the sweet spot that I've found. And then maybe their net present value is 500 or 600. So that's what mid-tiers are looking for. And even some seniors are looking for that. That type of project, the economics I just described, that has a really good chance of getting built versus, let's say, a project in Alaska that has 30 million <laughs> gold ounces that has extreme permitting challenges and will cost $7 billion to build. So avoid that type of stock. Bigger isn't always better. Go for the smart play. So I won't name names here, but that's just one type of stock I would avoid to the developers. Okay, explorers are next. So explorers really shouldn't make up more than 20% of a portfolio they're higher risk, but they're also higher reward. So these are really early stage companies. You don't know if they're going to find anything. And even if they do find something, you don't know if it's going to be economical. The other thing to know is explorers don't always trade with the metals. So gold could go up and explorer might not even move. On the other hand, gold could go down and explorer could go up if they report some positive drill results. So it's less leverage to gold, in my opinion. Having said that, lately I've been putting a lot more money into Explorers that I'm really excited about just because of the insanely high upside potential that I see in some of these names. These are pre-resource stocks. They're pre-PEA study stocks. So nothing's been done, but the valuation is so low that there's the potential to make 10 times your money here. There's potential to make 20 times your money if you choose right because you can choose a company that literally has nothing of value, a $10 million market cap, and then through drilling and through technical studies, they could develop a multi-million ounce gold resource. They could put out a PEA study that shows in their present value, you know, in the hundreds of millions. So it's possible. I mean, these companies are the highest risk, but highest return stock. They don't produce cash flow. They need to issue equity and dilute shareholders because that's just how they raise money. I mean, there's no cash flow coming in. So there's definitely risk, but just keep in mind, you only need to hit on one of them. So if you own five explorers and one of them hits it big, that could have a really, really good impact on your portfolio returns. So that's why I really like explorers. I think just to name one example of an explorer that's hit it out of the park, Great Bear Resources in Canada, you know, their stock's gone from under 50 cents to $16. Another example, back in 2010, Redback Mining, 
at one point they were explorer, but then they turned into a developer and then they got bought out by Kinross for seven billion. So this is why it is worth owning these earlier stage companies, but you do have to choose them carefully. I put a ton of research into those names and then I know I'm gonna hit a home run on one of them. So I own probably six or seven explorers. Perfect, Steve. So when we're looking at these different stocks, whether it's a producer, developer, or an explorer, what kind of rules do you have in place for your portfolio to signal a buy, a hold, or a sell on these? Yeah, good question. So if I've rated a stock as a buy and I own the stock, it means that I've put in a lot of time and effort and laid out a really detailed investment case for why I feel like this stock is going to outperform its peers. And as long as that thesis doesn't materially change, I maintain that rating. So I don't ever change a rating or sell a stock because I'm down you know, 20% or 30%. That's not a reason to sell a stock, in my opinion. An example of when I would maybe change my rating would be if something changes with the company, the CEO leaves, or they suddenly change their strategy. You know, they have a really, really bad quarter a poorly timed acquisition, they overpay for a company, they have zero exploration to sell. So something has to happen. I would upgrade a stock to buy if I see an improvement in a company's production and cash costs over several quarters. If their balance sheet's improving, maybe they had a lot of debt previously and now they've reduced it greatly to the point where it's no longer a concern for me. So I look for positive trends when upgrading stocks from hold to buy. If I think a stock is a sell, that just means I'm not interested in them. Maybe there's a concern over valuation. Maybe I don't like the mining jurisdiction. Maybe for some reason I don't trust the management team. You know, maybe they just haven't had much success in the past or they had big failures in the past. Maybe their project has very high permitting risk. And those are some reasons why I would rate a stock as a sell. And then finally, there are some stocks I just would never touch for various reasons in this sector. And so those stocks I have rated as strong sell. And so that's kind of how I look at it. To break that down, my rules are ratings don't change based on stock price action. Ratings change based on, you know, material changes to the investment. So really you're just trying to take the emotion out of the number on the stock price and believe in the, let's say the fundamental nature of each story, right? Yes, exactly. So recently, I bought shares of a U.S.-based developer at above a dollar a share. My cost basis is probably a dollar oh seven. The stock's down to about eighty cents, and I'm buying more because I know that that share price decline isn't for any material reason. The thesis that I've laid out has not changed at all. It's only gotten better, and there's no reason to sell. So as long as everything's the same, you know, nothing's changed within the company. I'll be buying that stock, you know, really soon. So I'll be dollar cross averaging my position down. Perfect. So Steve, as you're mentioning jurisdiction, what are some of the pieces that you take into consideration when looking at jurisdiction? So you recently wrote an article called how to take advantage of the Newfoundland gold rush, right? Yeah. So using that as an example, tell us a bit about how you look at jurisdiction. Yeah, great question. So as far as jurisdiction, I think just generally a pro-mining policy is important for some indication that the country is committed towards working with miners, stable policies in place. So I look at the Fraser Institute's annual survey of mining companies each year. It's a free resource for investors. That's a good place to get a feel for what jurisdictions are kind of on the rise or on the fall as far as policy taxation and exploration, best mineral practices point of view. So you can find which ones are considered the best and the worst jurisdictions from that report. As far as mineral potential, so that was the first part of this is policy, you know, which governments are favorable. Second part is mineral potential. I think it's smart to look for gold where it's likely to be found, <laughs> to put it simply. So I look at areas where other companies are finding gold already or hints of finding a major discovery. So early stage projects that are located on the same gold belt as current gold deposits, to put that more simply. So example of jurisdictions I really like would be West Africa, parts of Canada and the United States. They're all very pro mining and there's more discoveries to be made. So you brought up Newfoundland. 
So Newfound Gold is exploring. They have a massive land package. It's situated on the Dog Bay line, right? So that's a future zone that it hosts several high-grade gold deposits, which include the Dalradian, the Irish company. You know, they have that 6 million ounce gold deposit in Ireland. Marathon Gold's gold deposit, over 4 million ounces, is on that Dog Bay line as well. And then Oceana Gold has their 4 million ounce deposit in South Carolina. Those three are all located on the Dog Bay line. And so Newfound Gold owns a really large land package in Newfoundland, which, by the way, Newfoundland is considered, I think it's one of the top five jurisdictions in the world for gold mining. Very, very favorable jurisdiction. But Newfound Gold has already drilled some very, very impressive results from their deposit as a private company. And now as a public company, they've been public I think maybe five months, they're hitting some incredible grades over wide intersections as well. So they're hitting like 40 grams over 20 meters and it's near surface. So, I mean, Newfoundland, so there's two parts, again, there's two parts of this. Is the jurisdiction friendly? Yes, Newfoundland is right at the top of the Fraser Institute survey. Then this particular company, Newfound Gold, as the example, is exploring on the same geological structure has three other 4 million ounce gold deposits, okay? So that's mineral potential. And then you take the drill results that they've reported. And finally, I look at, okay, who else is investing here? Is there big money pouring in here? And absolutely. I mean, there's new companies investing in this region, it seems like, every day now. And I know Eric Sprott has invested heavily in this area. I know Rob McEwen is investing there. So people who know far more about gold mining and gold exploration are investing there. So that is a tremendous jurisdiction. I'm very proud of that piece that I put out on Seeking Alpha. It was turned out to be very well-timed. So I bought Newfound Golds on the U.S. exchange. My cost basis is maybe $1.45, $1.50 a share. The stock has outperformed greatly. It's shaping up to be an incredible discovery. It's a great mining jurisdiction. And yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. Perfect, Steve. So that brings to mind another question about you're saying you bought it on the U.S. exchange. So tell us the difference between, let's say, TSX listings and OTC listings. Yeah, sure. So for U.S. investors, I mean, a lot of us don't have access to the TSX. Some of us do. It just depends on the brokerage you use. But the difference is the Canadian stocks are going to trade on the OTC exchange in America and potential issues, much lower trading volume. So it's harder to buy and sell stock on the OTC. There's less people doing so. Having said that, I mean, I pretty much buy all of my positions on the OTC. And to date, I haven't had any issues placing trades. I also don't look to buy and sell out of shares frequently. I'm more of a long-term investor. So I hold my positions for at least a year, typically. So I don't let this stop me from investing. If there's a stock that I really, really like, like Newfound Gold, for example, The volume was very, very low when I bought shares, but I was able to get my order filled and I'm really happy with that purchase. So yeah, that's the difference. You know, if you can buy on the TSX, it might make more sense for you because of the higher trading volume. If you buy on the OTC, just know that the volume is going to be lower. It's harder to buy and sell shares on the OTC. You know, you have to use limit orders. You want to get filled at the price that you want to buy it. Market orders, just fill it as soon as possible you can end up paying more for it than you really want. So use limit orders. The other thing is knowing the difference between Canadian and U.S. dollars. The stocks on the Canadian exchange are going to trade in Canadian dollars, which is higher than U.S. dollars because the exchange rate is 1 Canadian to 76 U.S. So this can be confusing to some investors when they see a stock price in U.S., but maybe on online they've seen it quoted in Canadian terms. So just know that there's going to be a difference in price for that reason. If you want to know the fair price of buying a gold stock on the U.S. exchange and it trades on the Canadian exchange, look up the Canadian price and plug it into a calculator that converts Canadian to U.S. dollars, and then you'll see what it should be priced at in U.S. dollars. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think that's a great distinction there, Steve. So let's move on a little bit to, I read a piece on your site that highlights the HUI to gold price ratio, and it's showing how undervalued these stocks really are. So tell us a bit more about that, please. Yeah. So the gold bugs index, the HUI, I call it HUI, 
to gold ratio. So that takes one share of the gold bugs index, the Huey. It's a basket of some of the largest gold mining stocks, and it divides it by the price of gold. So this ratio um, currently is 0.18 times. It hit a low of 0.10 times in 2015, but the ratio has been as high as 0.60 times in 2005. In 2010, it hit 0.40. So essentially, the fair value of what a mining stock should trade at compared to the price of gold, it's somewhere in between 0.40 to 0.60. And so we're well below that. We're at 0.18 times. So if you do the math there, see what is the fair value for gold mining stocks compared to the actual price of gold. If gold were to rise to $3,000 an ounce, that's my price target, you know, looking out a couple of years from here. That means if we get to 0.40, that the Huey should be 1,200, right? It should be 1,200 to get to that ratio. That's 400% higher from current levels because the Huey is currently 326 a share. So that's not crazy to believe that that will happen. If gold goes to $3,000 an ounce, the mining stocks are going to be massively profitable, way more profitable than they are now. I don't think it's crazy to see that happen. So that is a good indicator that I'd keep a close eye on. Another thing to note that back in 2011, when gold peaked at $1,900 an ounce, the Huey traded at $618 a share. Gold is obviously the same price now than it was back in 2011, but the Huey is $326 a share. So it doesn't really make much sense how undervalued the miners are. Can I talk quickly about some valuation metrics that I track related to this? Yeah, of course. Okay. So several of the senior gold miners are trading at about 10 times, 11 times earnings. The median price of earnings for the sector is about 12. Some trade as low as eight times earnings. The S&P 500 price to earning ratio is about 33. So just using that basic valuation metric, gold miners are trading three times cheaper than typical stock. The metric to consider is enterprise value divided by EBITDA. So earnings before interest taxes deductions and amortization, and then enterprise value. The sector median is about nine to 10 times that, right? And so that's the sector median. And for consumer staples, it's 16. Consumer discretionary is 19. Healthcare is 15. Information technology is 19 times. And utilities is 12 times. Okay, so it's undervalued based on that too. It really doesn't make much sense to me. Why would gold miners be trading at a lower ratio than utilities, for example? It's just mind-boggling to me. So I follow those metrics closely. So considering, let's say, all these metrics, another one that I wanted to bring up was how you use resources like the insider buying update to also inform some of your decisions in this space. So I've tracked insider buying and selling for years now. I think it's a smart strategy. When CEOs, directors, management teams, or major investors, that's 10% plus owners of the stock, whenever they make a trade, it's public information. So everyone has access to it. So it's not perfect. You don't want to just buy a stock because the insiders are buying, but it's just one piece of the puzzle for me. I've often found that insiders tend to time their purchases very, very smartly. So in the past, if there's a stock that I like, and then I've seen that the insiders are buying, I'll copy the insider's needs and buy two because I already like the stock and I see that the insiders are buying shares. If insiders are buying, it means that they think shares are going to go up in price, right? So they can sell for many reasons. Maybe they've exercised stock options and they want to just take some profits, but they only buy on the public market if they think the stock is going to go up in price. The other part of that is I like it when companies, the insiders own a big stake. So there's a high percentage of ownership. It shows me that they're bullish and they've got some skin in the game. So this is important, especially for smaller juniors, the smaller companies. You know, it's a big deal if a company has 20% insider ownership and it's a $50 million market cap. That's huge. I mean, they've got real skin in the game. This company matters to them. Probably all of their network, a large portion of, of their personal network. If it works out for them, they're going to make a ton of money. So I really like to see that. And then on the other hand, if it's a multi-billion dollar company and there's maybe 1% ownership, no insider buying, that does not matter because most likely those executives are going to be paid based on you know, salary options. 
But for the smaller ones, it's, it's really nice to see that they own, that they're buying, that they own. Yeah, I definitely recommend tracking insider buying and insider ownership. It's worked for me. Excellent, Steve. So considering that you're the gold mining bull, what are your thoughts on silver and silver miners? And why don't you focus on those as much? So I do like silver. Silver prices, I think, are going to go much higher. I've got nothing against silver. I think there's actually just as much silver price upside as gold in this bull market because of industrial demand. Once we see inflation take off, I think the demand for silver is going to skyrocket. I really like the potential from solar and investment demand from smaller retail investors. I know a lot of smaller investors like silver because they can buy much more compared to gold. The potential for greater returns attracts them as well. So, you know, silver at twenty dollars is really nice. It can easily go to sixty. Gold at two thousand, you know, maybe it goes to three thousand, four thousand. The returns are on a percentage basis potentially smaller. It also really doesn't take much to move silver higher because it's such a smaller market. But to answer your question, I don't focus as much on the miners because I just don't think there's that many good silver miners to choose from. Mm-hmm. There's maybe only two that I like. Mostly that's because there just aren't many primary silver mines in the world. Silver is often mined as a byproduct of gold and sometimes copper. And so a lot of the company silver also produce gold, and so they're gold miners. But the ones that do produce primarily silver, you know, there's maybe two that I like. I'm keeping a close eye on them. I think as we speak, they actually might be a really good opportunity here. They've sold off hard. Of course, silver sold off along with gold. If silver goes back down to $20 or even $18, I think we're going to see some really, really good opportunity in the silver miners. So, yes, I keep an eye on them. Gold is my focus, but silver miners, the few that I like have really good potential in my opinion. I would also add that there are some really interesting silver explorers, which I do own probably three of them that focus primarily on exploring for silver deposits. So yeah, that's my feelings on silver and silver miners. Perfect, Steve. So my only real other question here is when we saw the effects of the shutdowns and stuff, basically the effects of COVID on the mining industry this year, do you think we're going to get another buying opportunity like that coming into, let's say, post-election here? So COVID was definitely a shockwave for the sector. Looking back at March and April, when everything sold off, the miners sold off really hard. We saw some impact to production. So I think we could see another sell-off in gold if COVID gets really bad. Again, it's possible, but I'm not expecting any major interruptions to mining companies. I'm not expecting countries to implement the same restrictions that they implemented back in March and April. I would be shocked. Just my feeling, my opinion, I can tell you in the U.S., most likely they're not going to issue uh, stay-at-home orders like they did back then. I think everyone's just pretty much over it at this point. And, you know, you're, you go out, you wear a mask, people aren't going to listen anyway, even if the U.S. tries to implement a similar type of order. But if the mining stocks do see COVID impact, it's not going to be a huge issue, in my opinion. It was very short-lived in the second quarter. You know, it hit production for a few miners for Q2. But a lot of the miners actually weren't impacted. You know, it just depends where your operation is and what the orders were from that particular country. I also want to add that I think several miners did a really good job responding to the crisis and implementing safety procedures. One example is Barrick Gold. So I don't think everyone knows this, but Barrick actually started preparing for COVID and its response back in early March. This was before things got really bad. And this is actually when various leaders around the world were kind of downplaying the virus still. So Barrick had a really early start to it and their production is impacted, but it has not really had a huge impact on their business this year. They've also provided a lot of support to communities during the crisis, which is nice to see. So yeah, as far as COVID impact, I'm pretty confident in saying that miners like Barrick have a good plan in place to respond to it that if things get really bad, they'll be prepared. And so I'm not expecting a big crisis, but I think the miners that I own, at least, I know they're ready for it. They've got that plan in place. So I feel good investing in them if we do see another dip because of COVID. 
Interesting. Steve, as we prepare for little dips in the market like this, how do you go about thinking about your cash position? Do you try to keep a percentage of your portfolio in cash or do you have rules in place that you base on certain metrics to be more invested rather than less? That is a great question. Up until this point, I have not had any rules about how much cash I should have in the portfolio. I think as a general rule, it's smart to probably have about 5% 5% to 10% in cash at all times. It seems pretty smart. So if you have a $100,000 portfolio, it makes sense to keep five to $10,000 of cash on hand in case you do see a really good buying opportunity. So right now, I probably am about 30% cash only because I've recently just put a bunch of money into the portfolio, money that I've been saving. I pretty much put everything I earned from my blog into the portfolio. And as much as I can, I put back into the gold investments that I have in that spreadsheet that I share with my subscribers. So, I mean, I plan on investing heavily up until I get to about 10% cash. I think that's a smart rule of thumb. And then as far as like taking profit and buying, you know, when gold hits oversold levels, when you're looking at the charts and you look at the relative strength index, Or if you look at the commodity channel index, if it hits oversold levels, it's generally a good time to buy. If you hit overbought levels, it's generally a good time to take some profits. Personally, I try to take profits when gold is looking overbought. And as a general rule of thumb, whenever I've doubled on a position, I do take profits no matter what. How much, it depends. But, you know, for example, Kirkland Lake Gold, I've done really well on. I sold several shares throughout the past two years, just because I had made 300% returns on my initial investment, but then I still hold the stock. So that's two ways to look at it. You know, you can definitely benefit from the volatility of this sector if you're smart with your purchases. Don't go all in at once, you know, buy in increments, keep some cash on hand and just buy the dip. That's the best advice I think I can give to people. Excellent, Steve. As we wrap up, is there any other thoughts you'd like to share with our audience? To wrap up, so M&A potential for gold in this sector is tremendous, in my opinion. We've just seen the beginning of it with Barrick Gold when they took over Brand Gold, the merger. I think there would have been a bunch more mergers this year, if not for COVID. But I think next year, we're going to see a ton of M&A activity in the sector. I think it's going to be great for the sector. There's way too many gold companies. And I think M&A is a great thing if you can take one plus one and equal three. So if there's synergies involved between combining the two companies and there's cost savings involved, then it's good for investors and it should be done. So for example, combining two gold projects into one, it can be a very smart move. Combining expertise and management teams and reducing expenses can be good for shareholders. So there's definitely a ton of M&A potential in this sector. More importantly for investors, to know is that I think there is a ton of opportunity to invest in companies that are going to move up the food chain and get bought out by larger companies. So explorers are going to turn into developers and into juniors, and juniors are going to get bought out by mid-tiers, and mid-tiers are going to get bought out by seniors, right? So the seniors, this all comes down to gold reserves, and the seniors need to add gold reserves outside of their own exploration efforts, what they've got going on in their company, they're going to need to add to their reserves. And the explorers are the companies that have the product that they desperately are going to need in the future. So that's going to be the story of the next three to five years. The huge winners in this sector are going to be the developers and some of the explorers, in my opinion, because of the need of the product is going to be there. The seniors are going to need to replace their reserves and the mid-shares are going to look for that growth opportunity. So the potential is incredible. I'm really excited to be investing in this sector. And I think people are going to make a lot of money. Yeah. For those of us that have been in this industry, let's say since 2011, 2012, it feels like a long time coming, but it's finally really starting to pay off with some of the time and effort put into this space. Steve, we can find you at Gold Mining Bull on Twitter and also under the same handle at Seeking Alpha. Is there anywhere else you'd like to share with our listeners? No, just say, you know, give me a shot if you want to try out my service on Seeking Alpha. We give a 30-day money-back guarantee. I really pride myself in that I'm independent. 
The only person paying me is my subscribers. I don't get paid by any companies. I'm not influenced by anyone's opinions other than my own. I do all of my own research. And I would just say, you know, give me a shot. I know you'll be happy with my service. And please do your own research as well. And thank you very much for this opportunity. This was uh, really awesome. Thanks for sharing your expertise with us, Steve. And we'll get an update from you soon. Yep. Thank you. Take care. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on at Yeti?